the rod of Moses, which becomes the rod of God. Think about Moses. As a baby, he was put in a wicker basket and floated among the bulrushes, saved from certain death, found and adopted by Pharaoh's uh, daughter or sister, as the uh, case may be, then miraculously nursed by his own mother. Then he is trained in all the arts of war in Pharaoh's palace as a prince of Egypt. He then kills an Egyptian taskmaster with one blow, mind you. You can imagine how strong he was. He then flees and he ends up becoming a shepherd to Jethro's flock in the deserts of Midian. He is described as a stammerer, one who's not fluent in speech, whereas his brother Aaron was eloquent. Uh, two other things about this period in Moses' life. He spends 40 years as a shepherd tending sheep in Midian. The Bible tells us he lived for 120 years. So he spent the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's palace thinking he was somebody. The next 40 years of his life he spent in the desert tending sheep, realizing or finding out, discovering he was nobody. And then the last 40 years of his life, God showed Moses that he could make God could make a somebody out of a nobody. Moses is also described as the meekest man who ever lived. Meek, meekest. Now let's not confuse meekness for weakness. Rather, meekness is strength brought under control. Don't forget, with one roundhouse punch, he felled and killed a tough Egyptian taskmaster. So he wasn't a weak man. Meekness is strength brought under control. So it's a tremendously positive attribute to possess or develop. Now in Exodus chapter 3, there's the incident of the burning bush. And we're actually going into chapter 4. But at the burning bush, Moses stands alone. He's tending his sheep. He then beholds this sight, incredible sight of a bush burning, but yet not being consumed. All he's accoutred with are his robe, his sandals, and he has his rod. And there's reasons for each. The robe just provides cover for protection for his body. That's normal. The sandals are very important to pro protect his feet from the scorching desert sand in the daytime. But much more importantly, from desert scorpions or even maybe snakes. But the rod in his hand. It's not just to protect him from potential snakes, but from any wild animal that would attack the flock of sheep and even him. So the rod is paramount for his safety and protection. So God, before the burning bush, and you'll find this in Exodus chapter 3, first tells Moses to take off his sandals before the burning bush, which is where representing the presence of God. Um, because God tells him, take your sandals off. The place on which you're standing is holy ground. So, a little by little, slowly, slowly, God strips or takes or tears away the crutches that we tend to lean on. So first, Moses, take off your sandals. So that's removing protection from desert scorpions. Okay? 
It's a we who tend to be impatient and want to jump the gun many a times and put the cart before the horse and get everything done at one shot. Now God works generally a little at a time, like peeling the layers off an onion. So the protection for Moses' feet is gone. Immediately it makes him vulnerable. You ever had that feeling in your relationship with God? And sometimes we get so defensive. We need to take those defenses down. We need to make ourselves voluntarily vulnerable before God. Now, his feet have got to bear the hot sand under them and there's the potential for desert scorpions. Believe me, I understand that because I used to live in Phoenix, Arizona and I've seen a, a scorpion or two by a wash uh, when I used to go for walks sometimes in the evening. A couple times after the pest controller came through, there was a tiny dead scorpion in one of the rooms of the house. True. So with Moses having no sandals, there's no protection and you don't want to be bitten, stung, stung by the tail of a poisonous scorpion. The pain is horrific from all I've read and heard. So, one bit of protection is gone. Then in Exodus, and, and I would encourage you, just read the first four verses. Exodus chapter 4 is our main text. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. In verse 2, God asks Moses now a question. He's already told him to take off his shoes. So there's only one piece of protection he has. And God says, what is that in thine hand? What are you holding on to, Moses? A rod. My rod. This is the question God is asking of each one of us today. What am I clutching onto, holding onto? We use the term security blanket for little children or babies or a particular doll or a shawl that they hold on to. What is your security blanket? What are you clutching onto, holding onto for dear life that is almost means as much as life to you? This is Moses' last resource, last uh, uh, defense mechanism, the last thing he wanted to let go of was that rod. God, this is what God is asking of each one of us. Maybe for you and me. It could be money, my job, I'm holding on tight, position, maybe my, your, your good looks, education, intelligence, knowledge, popularity. Any one of these could be our security. Or it could be on the flip side. What are we holding on to? Some secret sin in our lives that has not yet been discovered and that we don't want to let go of in today's day and age. Probably the worst among men is pornography, which is demonic from the pits of hell. Nobody knows. My pastor doesn't know. My wife doesn't know. But God knows, friend, what secret sin, some other extramarital affair. Maybe I'm doing drugs on the sly. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's a foul mouth. And yet I go to church on Sunday. Maybe I'm an elder or a deacon in the church. Maybe it's a Hasty temper, jealousy, hatred of someone. What is it we are holding on to? Whatever it is, I don't know. But you know and God knows. God says in verse 3 then to Moses, Throw it down, Moses. What are you holding in verse 2? My rod. Throw it down. Dear friend who's listening today, what are you holding on to? Whether it was one of the positive or negative things I listed. God is saying, throw it down. In other words, what he really means is there's nothing you should hold on to more tightly than focusing on me. The burning bush was right in front of Moses' face. 
That's enough to sustain you. I will be your God. I will be your helper. I will be your protection. I will be your provider. But you're looking to a rod. What are you and I holding on to? Clutching on to for dear life. Don't you know? Can't you see? Moses is trying to argue with God. This rod is my only security. Please, Lord, don't take it away from me. I've had it for as long as I can remember. How? I've gone used to it. I will be totally insecure without it. I would be bereft of all protection. It's the one thing I can fall back on in hard times. It's my crutch, Lord. God is saying to Moses and he's saying to you and me, throw it down. Look to me. Look to me as your entire source, provider and protector. Throw it down, Moses. But Lord, I've got to have something to lean on, something to depend on, especially in this desert here alone by myself with my sheep. What if I'm attacked by a wild animal? Remember the psalmist says the Lord is my helper. God is teaching Moses lesson upon lesson and line upon line. Trust me to be your protector. Trust me to be your helper. Throw it down, Lord. But Lord, can't a man have something, something he can call his own? Do you have to take everything away from me? This is my last possession. Do you have to take, strip me of everything? Throw it down, Moses. Finally, with no arguments left, Moses casts his rod, the rod of Moses. Very important phrase. He casts his rod on the ground. And immediately the rod turns into a hissing serpent. Here's the tall, proud, handsome, strong Moses, trained in the arts of war in the palaces of Egypt. He killed an Egyptian taskmaster with one blow. Guess what happens when his rod turns into a hissing snake? The Bible says, exact quote, Moses fled. He ran. But don't laugh. Wouldn't you run? I would too if I had no protection. Let me quick add this. I have personally killed a cobra with a hockey stick. Put a hockey stick in my hand, I'm not afraid. Of course, give me enough space. Before the snake can strike me as a field hockey player, and I know in America they have ice hockey, but with that hockey stick, regardless which one it is, you've got enough space between the two of you and you can hit that snake and knock it senseless before it strikes you. So I would not be afraid of a snake. I don't care what snake. Unless, of course, it's spitting poison. That's a little different. I'm not afraid to face a snake with a hockey stick in my hand. Moses would not have been afraid to face that serpent with a stick in his hand. Why do you think God did not just land a snake up there in front of Moses while he had the stick. Because with that stick, Moses would have smacked that snake senseless. God first took away his rod. <laughs> That's so important. He took away his only weapon of defense. Which means, Moses, I want you to completely, totally depend on me. Rely on me and me alone. So Moses flees. So before you laugh at him, you and I would likely do the same thing. All right? Because he has no rod to defend himself with. Or maybe while he was fleeing, he is looking for a rod, another stick. Can we blame him for running? God was humbling Moses. You may be schooled in the arts of war. You may be strong with bulging biceps. You may be intelligent and schooled in all of Egypt's educational institutions, but before the snake alone in the desert with no shoes and no stick, no rod, 
You're running for your life. You are helpless. We too must drop our defenses before Almighty God. Let me throw this in. While we're at the talking about dropping, we need to drop. Get rid of, flee those lusts, that pornography, that illicit affair, whatever, that, that temper, anger, uh, whatever it is that's amiss in our lives, where we've let Satan come and we need to get rid of it. Now, while he flees, God says, turn around, pick up that hissing snake by the tail. That's in verse 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 4. Pick it up, Moses, by the tail. By now, you can imagine Moses is sweating bullets. He doesn't want to be bitten by a poisonous snake in the desert with nobody else to help him. He would surely have died right there. And God says, bend down, pick it up by the tail. Wow. I can imagine Moses thinking, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. Is this some kind of a joke or what? Surely you've made some mistake. I've been in working in this desert for 40 years and you're trying to tell me to pick up that snake by the tail? Pick it up, Moses, by the tail. So far and so long, Moses had been running. He fled Egypt. He was fleeing the call of God in his life. He was called of God and raised by God to be the deliverer of Egypt. God was showing him a major life lesson. I want you to stop running for your life. Face the enemy square. Pick that rod up. Pick that snake up by the tail and see what happens. Stop running from Pharaoh. Stop running from Egypt. Stop running from my call on your life. And you do what I want you to do. And so, no arguments left, nowhere to run. Moses, desperate, bends down and picks it up by the tail. And immediately, what happens? It turns, most comfortingly, into a piece of dead wood. Back into his old rod. Thank God. For that I'm sure he was thrilled comfortable dead wood again in his hands and now God asks him again what do you have in your hand Moses it's like Lord Lord it's, it's, it's my rod it's my rod this was the same rod of Moses that had experienced the touch of God on it now watch while we come shortly to the end of this teaching. Verses 6 and 7. Now God instructs him after Moses sees the miraculous power of God here. I want you to go back to Egypt. Go back to Pharaoh. And you are to bring my people out of bondage under Pharaoh. Out into the promised land that I will show you. And if Pharaoh will not believe you or listen to you. In verses 3 and 4. We read this, chapter 4 of Exodus, verses 3 and 4. If he will not listen to you, cast the rod down, it will turn into a snake. And we know in the actual incident that does happen, and the magicians replicate that uh, with their magic, what we call black magic. And so God, to prove himself, Moses' serpent eats up the other serpents. Then he picks it up by the tail. And if they will not listen to you, then put your hand into your bosom. What happened when you put it out? It was white leprous with leprosy put it back in take it out it was normal healthy flesh that's the second miracle you will show if they don't believe the first and if they won't believe these two then in verse 9 of chapter 4 of exodus take a pitcher of water from the nile river and pour it out in front of pharaoh it will turn into blood in front of his face so these were three miracles the lord had spoken to moses in this chapter to do to get pharaoh to believe that Moses was sent by God. But how soon? After God showing Moses these three things, miracles, that he could perform in front of Pharaoh, he is still thinking escapism, 
Still doubt and fear and unbelief creeps in his mind and heart. And he says, ah, oh, but you know, I stammer. I can't even speak straight. And uh, how about Aaron? I'm going to use a modern day expression. Aaron was evidently, obviously, an eloquent, fluent speaking man, an orator. So Aaron would be the kind we would describe as, Aaron was a, uh, was a man who never met a mic he didn't like. Aaron was articulate. He was an orator. What about Aaron? I'm a stammerer. Let me have someone to come beside me to face Pharaoh and face the music. He is a class speaker, orator. Please, Lord. And God responds in verse 11. Who has made man's mouth? God is not amused with Moses. Who has made man's mouth? Anyway, and he says, have not I, the Lord? Okay, God acquiesces to Moses' request and allows him and says, okay, take Aaron with you. I will speak to you. You speak as the mouth of God to him so that he will say what you tell you and you tell him what I tell you. All arguments are now quelled. No more arguments for Moses to make. And in verse 20, this is key. It's huge. Exodus 4 verse 20. And Moses took the rod of God. For the first time we see that what was the rod of Moses is now called the rod of God. Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Hallelujah. The rod of Moses became the rod of God. God, whatever it is you and I are hanging on to for dear life, holding on to, clutching dear friend, hand it over to God, hand it over to Jesus and watch him make a phenomenal change, effect change that will last for the rest of our lives to impact souls for his kingdom and expand his kingdom on this earth. The rod of Moses now is called the rod of God. What happened, friends? In Pharaoh's court, we know that Moses' snake ate all the other snakes. Yes, Satan has some power, but God is all-powerful. Yes, Satan is mighty, but our God is almighty, hallelujah, with the rod of God. Moses, later when leading the children of Israel through the desert and their journey to the promised land, with that rod of God, he struck the rock, and that rock was Christ. And what came out of the rock? Water for the whole nation. And Christ is also the living water. Wow, because of the rod of God that Moses had in his hand. 1 Corinthians 10 4 says that rock was Christ. What about the parting of the Red Sea? Moses held that rod and said, Stand still to Israel and see the salvation of our God. And when he struck forward toward the Red Sea, or the, uh, toward the waters, the waters parted and the children of Israel walked over on dry land. What are you holding in your hand today, my friend? I urge you to give it up. Give it away. Throw it down. And allow God to change the ordinary into the extraordinary. Never forget, God changed the rod of Moses into the rod of God. Amen.